GMP, GLP, GCP, what are they? And more importantly, which ones do I have to follow and which can I safely ignore? And if I have to address any of these TLAs, that's short for three-letter acronyms, when do they come into play? We'll answer these and more on today's episode of MedTech Crossroads. Today's show is really all about quality. When we talk about good manufacturing practice, good laboratory practice, good clinical practice, we're talking about what people refer to as quality systems. One website even calls these three the golden trio of quality. And from a med tech perspective, that's not far from the truth. But the med tech community is actually a latecomer to the world of quality systems. So before we talk about GMP, GLP, and GCP, I want to give you a little history. William Edwards Deming is known as the father of quality. Deming was born in 1900 and initially trained as an electrical engineer, later moving into mathematical physics and statistical process control, helping to rebuild Japan's post-war infrastructure. He was in Japan giving a lecture on statistical process control. On that trip, he was discovered by the Union of Japanese Scientists and Engineers, who asked him to consult with them not on statistical process control, but on his theories of management. As it turns out, the rest is history. And with Deming's insights, Japanese industry pulled ahead of its American counterpart, creating products of unrivaled quality at the time. Deming had some revolutionary ideas. One that's near and dear to my heart is that there really should not be a quality department. He observed that you don't get quality by inspecting it into an already existing product. You get quality by empowering all layers of the organization to constantly improve. Allow them to take pride in their work, how they're bringing quality to their part of the organization. Quality, not quotas. These ideas and more can be found in Deming's 14 Points, published in 1987. From these beginnings, quality systems thinking has spread all over the world. At root, the idea is creating processes that can be observed and improved, and that's what should drive production. Gone are the days of a single person plying their craft to create a complete finished product. Now we need a way for lots of talented people to work together harmoniously without dropping the ball or playing the blame game. But Deming's ideas don't happen overnight or automatically. They require good faith and a lot of hard work as anyone who's ever worked under a quality system or built one can attest to. But when they work properly, they can smooth the path for everyone. In a nutshell, quality systems thinking is all about the processes you follow before, during, and after development and production. Just keep in mind, You can't inspect quality in afterwards. You just can't do it. And this is a common fallacy that we see at all stages of the product development process. Many entrepreneurs come to us at Into Being with a mostly designed product, but it hasn't been designed under GMP. Sometimes they come to us having completed some bench testing, but it hasn't been done under GLP. Fortunately, it's hard to conduct clinical trials in the U.S. without at least paying lip service to GCP or good clinical practice. But that doesn't stop innovators from designing clinical trials without input from FDA. And that's really another topic and the subject of a completely different episode. So what are GMP, GLP, and GCP? GMP, Good Manufacturing Practice, or 21 CFR 820, is the regulation in the US that in general, and although there are exceptions, medical device companies need to follow in the development, production, and distribution of medical devices. GLP, Good Laboratory Practice, or 21 CFR 58, is the regulation in the US that again, in general, although there are some exceptions, med tech companies, not just medical device companies, need to follow in non-clinical testing or bench testing to support applications for research or marketing permits for products regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. GCP, or good clinical practice, comprises a number of regulations covering everything from protection of human subjects to the role of institutional review boards to regulations regarding financial disclosures 
for investigators to make sure that there's not a conflict of interest. This is all for those who are developing evidence to support the safety and effectiveness of investigational drugs, biological products, and medical devices. FDA says that clinical investigators who conduct these studies are required to comply with applicable statutes and regulations. These laws and regulations are intended to ensure the integrity of clinical data on which product approvals are based, as well as to help protect the rights, safety, and welfare of human subjects. So I'd love to cover each of these in detail in another video, but for today, the questions we want to look at briefly are, which of these do I have to worry about? And when do I have to worry about them? Assuming that many of you are entrepreneurs developing medical technologies, I'm gonna answer this from your perspective. Many medical device clearances will involve the application of not only GMP, but also GLP and GCP. And usually in that order. The good news is that GLP and GCP are usually the responsibility of your test lab and clinical partner, respectively. But here's the catch. Many test labs can't do GLP testing. And it comes as a surprise when you find this out too late, like when FDA asks for it to be GLP. And most institutional review boards address the basics of GCP, but we've noticed over the years that it really pays to have a familiarity with at least the basics of GCP because most research institutions are doing what they need to do to protect patients, but they're not really doing this research most of the time for FDA submission. FDA will pay particular attention to how that data is collected, more so than the average peer review committee. As I said before, I'd like to do a whole episode on the dangers of complying with GCP, but failing to do a pre-sub with FDA to discuss the clinical trial design, but that's for another time you can perform a perfectly valid test that FDA nevertheless finds unconvincing. So for GLP and GCP, from the entrepreneur's standpoint, learn about them, keep in mind that your provider for bench testing or clinical testing may not have specific experience in FDA submissions, so keep watch out for that. As for GMP, a word to the wise, you don't need it all in place at day one, but once you start moving, you're gonna need to comply with certain parts of it, and the rest later on as you move forward. As an example, design controls, which we've covered on the show before, is an important part of GMP, and it applies to many, many medical device development projects. FDA clearly tells their inspectors two things, and from these, we can find a really appropriate place to start ramping your internal quality system. FDA says that the firm's development of concepts and the conduct of feasibility studies are not subject to the design control requirements of the regulation. However, once the firm decides that a design will be developed, a design plan must be established. A firm will determine when it will begin to apply design controls, However, design controls must be applied no later than the time the firm approves its first set of inputs. So once you formally approve your first set of inputs, you need to be under design controls, which are an important early part of GMP. So why not wait until the last minute to implement this, to approve your inputs, sign them off a day before shipping product? What could possibly go wrong? FDA also says this to their inspectors in the same document. Confirm that acceptance criteria were established prior to the performance of verification and validation activities. And even more specifically, determine if design verification confirmed that design outputs met the design input requirements. This means that you can actually play in the sandbox until it's time to do verification and validation but you're gonna need released design inputs with acceptance criteria to achieve VNV. So there's actually a hard limit to how long you can wait to start these things. This means that we can craft a strategy that leaves your development team free in the early months of development and ramp the control over time rather than dumping it on your team from day one. So in summary, for many medical device development projects, GMP, GLP, and GCP may be required. It's important to have familiarity with all three, even if you don't feel you're directly responsible for at least two of them. But chances are GMP is gonna be the one that consumes a lot of your attention 
And you may have to direct traffic on the other two with your service providers who may or may not be used to doing clinical research that's specifically targeted towards FDA. Well, as always, we hope that learning on MedTech Crossroads saves you time on your medical device development journey. Be sure to subscribe for more content like this.